Welcome everyone to Economy Panel. Uh, my name is Dragan Juricin and I will moderate this panel. As we know, World Academy's events like this one are regularly offering uh, challenging experience for participants. Uh, by the way, uh, each conference is a place of motivation as well as a place of strengthening mutual trust. Uh, this is a networking with impact for future we want. Fault lines of economic system based of neoliberal set of premises are well known and the related economic system is not sustainable. Also results of such economic system are not sustainable too. For example, systemic high income concentration is not sustainable. If people destroy environment and by doing that, increasing the chances for global warming and microbe mutations, everyone live in poverty in the future. Uh, I would like to remind you that due to last microbe pandemic, the world economy in the first half of this year passed near that experience. After twin shocks from demand and supply side, V-shaped recovery is unlikely and economy remains in recession. Projections of credible institutions like Oxford Economics shows that the world economy will not be back in the pre-crisis level until the end of 2022. Anyway, the world being paralyzed by unpredictability syndrome, every government in the world simultaneously performs a, the flattening of the epidemic curve as much as possible with the aim to save human lives and avoid medical system overload, and b, steepening the output J-shaped curve with the aim to preventing an economy freefall. In this panel, the crisis management program in such complex crisis, medical crisis and economic crisis, is out of our interest. So we are dealing with turnaround strategy or catalytic leadership strategy in terms of World Academy with the aim to create new economics rule for sustainable and inclusive model of growth and related policy platform. But doing this is not possible without paradigm change. More than 40 years of experience confirmed that the neoliberal model of growth and the related policy platform based on shareholders, capitalism, market fundamentalism, supply side economics, and deflation targeting in good time, as well as unconventional core macroeconomic policies in bad time are not sustainable. Last medical crisis only deepened evident fractures of the system. Second wave infection fears caked in. We never seen crisis we have right now. Except economic risk, social risk, and geopolitical risk, bio risk is growing dramatically. No doubt, the new contingency in the next normal is going to be microbe mutations, pandemics, and super infections. What is not sustainable with not sustain. So paradigm change is imperative of our time. In search for catalytic leadership strategy in the last three days, we have mentioned nexus of forces within the objective normal, the new normal, and the next normal. In time when some black pessimist says that the world is on the brink of ecological cataclysm, medical catastrophe, and economic free fall, discussion which promoting hope instead of fear by offering better economic rules, able to mitigate structural imbalances from the past, asymmetric shocks and black swan events from these days, and future contingency, all with purpose for pending systemic and structural reforms could be encouraging and healthy. Simplify at the maximum, this panel is about impact of the objective normal, the new normal, and the next normal of new economic rules, along with definition of components of structural program agenda, like mind setting, sources of growth, model of growth, the role of macroeconomic policies, monetary and fiscal, and industrial policies, all of them from the different perspectives. Structural panelists comes with the content. 
In the panel, we have distinguished line of speakers. We are pleased that organizational committee has extended duration of this panel on two hours, but one 20 minutes is not too much of eternity, but it would be good enough for identification of some good ideas. When it comes to time limits in discussion, my advice will be that each panelist will have five to seven minutes per answer, including maximum two minutes to present yourself, along with the answer on the first question. We have to be more informative and encouraging and focused on solution. In the first part of the panel, let's say extended opening, Gary and Frank, by answering my questions, actually are making the framework of discussion through their introductory remarks. We start with Gary. Gary, your firm determination to overthrow an ongoing growth model and related economic policy platform is evident. We do welcome very much such behavior. My question to you is, what are the fundamental values embodied in the nexus of SDGs of which future economic system should be founded in order to meet the aspirations and goals of all of us and not harming the nature. Also, I want to ask you one related question more. Is back to normal is good enough for definition of rebound after Corona-19 crisis? Dragon, thank you so much for the introduction and for agreeing to moderate this conference. You've done this session, you've done everything but introduce yourself as a very distinguished economist from Serbia with decades of practical experience of which I have some personal insight uh, during the most difficult times for Serbia. Uh, as a professor, as a head of one of the big five in Serbia, having all the different perspectives on this problem, as well as the modesty not to introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Th Thank you, Gary, for your support. I appreciate it. I think I've already been introduced enough time, so I'll spare that. Uh, I'm uh, very happy with the question uh, that you asked because to me it comes to the root of what, we're, what the, the problem is and what the solution is. And it's somewhat ironic that if we ask ourselves instead of the values on which the SDGs are based, what are the values on which contemporary economic theory is based, uh, I think it will be even more revealing because contemporary economic theory is based on a value of efficiency to maximize benefits. And yet those benefits and that efficiency are defined in such narrow terms that it's possible by maximizing the efficiency by those definitions or the benefits by those definitions, that we can destroy the planet, we can undermine society, we can undermine democracy, and we can completely ignore fundamental human rights. And that's because we're really building on a mechanistic concept of what economy is uh, and looking at it in terms of a physical system that we want to optimize. And I think that's fundamentally a, a flawed approach. And I would just like to, as a caveat, say that we've spent the last five years in the World Academy looking at the, the fundamental foundations of economic theory in a, a group we called New Economic Theory. And I'm what the views I'm sharing have been widely published and discussed at many conferences before. But it's a, I think it's a foundation for what uh, I'd like to discuss today. Uh, the SDGs, on the other hand, and Jeff Sachs in his comments uh, yesterday in the conference put it very well, very succinctly. The SDGs are not really something new. Uh, they are, the 17 SDGs came out of the Millennium Development Goals of, of 2000. Uh, which came out of the development goals of previous decades, which are traced right back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Uh, this is a value-based conception of 
human development, of, of human society, of life. Uh, and it includes all of the values, essential values of peace and security and equality uh, and employment and the, long, the whole list of the 17 and the 169 goals. But fundamentally, what it says is the human being is of fundamental importance. And as Jeff reminded us yesterday, and I know from our previous study, it's very interesting that when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was affirmed, uh, it was affirmed without any powers uh, uh, for enforcement. It was a set of accepted ideas or ideals, which nobody, especially in America, we couldn't deny the validity of these fundamental rights, but no government was ready to sign on and say, that these are enforceable rights. But over the decades since 1948, we have seen a successive evolution of international law to recognize that these are fundamental rights, they are enforceable and they must be implemented. And more and more they are translating into law and into public policy. But we are at a unique stage where 193 countries have agreed collectively on a consensus that these must be respected and implemented. I don't think 193 countries have ever agreed on anything uh, uh, before, uh, and certainly not when it impacts on everybody. Now, the implication behind this is we're talking about not just policy and institutions, but we're talking about what is economics as a science. And is it a science? And if we don't make explicit the values on which it is based, uh, then we really cannot uh, judge it and uh, judge its effectiveness. And my view is that economics is a subset of society. It doesn't exist independently. It's an absolutely artificial misconception to talk about economy as if you have economy without uh, the government governance. It used to be called political economy, but economy wanted to be independent. There's no economy without law. There's no economy without society. There's no economy without culture. There's no economy, obviously, without the environment, in the, in, despite the fact that we spent 200 years pretending that there was. And all we've been arguing for in the academy is economy, like everything else in society, is meant to serve a purpose. And its purpose is to promote human welfare and well-being. And any other purpose that is incompatible with that, that undermines that, has to be considered extraneous. And I would argue, uh, of course, that includes the sustainability of the planet, because without that, there's no human society anyway. We need not debate whether environment is a secondary or a, a, an additional or primary goal without supporting the environment. Uh, economic welfare and well-being is absolutely impossible. So I, I'm trying to answer the question in a widest way to say we need to put economy back within the society and put the human being at the center of that and ask ourselves whether our economic system and our economic philosophy uh, or ideology, I would say, is really serving its intended purpose. And then we can ask, is our financial system in, in, in serving its intended purpose? Or is it, have they become ends in themselves uh, divorced from the real central purpose of welfare? And the, the firm, the, the theory of the firm is the same thing. Do companies really exist to maximize profit? Company, the, the very idea of a public limited company, a chartered company was a privilege given by society for organizations that were serving society, not even for a profit originally. Later on, profit became recognized. It's now, we're quoting it as if it's a privilege uh, in itself, irrespective of its impact on society. So I think we need to put economics back in the context of the whole society and the human being at the center of that society and the rights of the, the human being individually and collectively as the foundation on which our economic policy, our economic theory, our economic institutions need to be based. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. It is a really good start. Uh, turning over to Frank. Uh, Frank, in your research, you pointed out massive economic 
unbalances and social and environmental harm related with current economic system. To offer solutions, you suggested system approach for multi-track economic reforms. One of idea you promoting is necessity to rede redirect cash flow from speculative investment to so-called impact investment, carbon-free investment, as well as investment in industries with high negative external effects. To implement previous, you advocated frequently SDGs as ultimate set of goals, but also as a proxy for the more equitable distribution of social power and promotion of the maximum well-being. Frank, my question to you is going to be, what is the impact of objective reality? This is your construct. My con construct is uh, objective normal, based on the requirement for SDGs achievements and how new economy could follow that requirements. And related with the previous, would you clarify distinction between investment in system change and direct investment in SDG, so impact investment. And finally, how to implement system thinking in both trajectories. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Dragan. It's an honor to be on this distinguished panel. I'm glad to address those questions. Um, my, my brief bio is I've worked in the responsible investing field for many years, advised Walmart and other companies on sustainability and written extensively on whole system approaches to human sustainability. So in terms of the question, how can objective reality-based requirements guide new economic rules and SDG achievements? The experts on this panel can go much more deeply into specific economic solutions than I can. I'll look at the big picture more. And um, while it may seem counterintuitive, Looking first at the whole system, I would suggest is the most effective way to come up with catalytic strategies. The big picture view shows us, as Gary said, that the economy is a subset of society, which is a subset of the whole earth system. And the purpose of the economy is to serve society. So one way to frame up sustainable society is to use the reality-based operating principles and laws of nature for 3.5 billion years, all species have been required to abide by certain principles and laws. With these, we can largely define the most important characteristics of sustainable society and say we know objectively beyond debate that this is what um, Earth is gonna look like. Whether or not we'll be here will depend on whether or not we abide by these laws. So in terms of the operating principles, these go well beyond the limits of nature, like how much carbon we can put in the atmosphere. They're the actual objective requirements for sustainability at a system level, at any level from the cell up to the whole or system. So it includes the common things we've been talking about for many years, the circular economy principles like produce no waste, limit growth, live off of renewable resources, but other implied operating principles of nature are equitable resource distribution, cooperation, equally valuing uh, generations and species, decentralizing governance and production, enabling and enabling individuals to reach their fullest potential. Other implied operating pr principles of sustainable systems are democracy, full cost accounting, producing no externalities, equality, and full employment. These aren't theories, these are actual requirements for a thriving system on this planet. When they're not present, the system either dies or changes. So the SDGs are a major achievement for humanity. They describe many aspects of sustainable society, but they're human-centric and the reality-based um, perspective for human sustainability uh, should be nature-centric. Um, Using nature as the center for sustainability moves us from the moral or subjective into objective reality. Abiding by the laws of nature is probably the most important requirement for achieving the SDGs. For example, if we were abiding by the principle of equitable resource distribution, we would largely achieve most of the SDGs. Now, once we have a clear picture of what sustainable society looks like, that helps us to see what are the systemic changes needed to get from here to there. 
One good way to frame that up for economic and political reform is with the rule of law, which says you're free to do whatever you want as long as you don't harm anyone. And we are grossly violating that principle. So, and it, it, there are many different system flaws, but if you were to roll them up into one overarching economic and political system flaw, it would be the failure to hold companies fully responsible for negative impacts. This creates a situation where companies can't afford to act in a fully responsible manner and remain, remain in business. So the, the meta solution is to hold companies fully responsible. There are many different system flaws that don't hold them responsible, limited liability, externalities, time value of money, things like that. But people in the future are gonna look back on us the way, the way we look back on uh, slavery. Um, while we don't intend to, the way we deal with corporate sustainability, for example, would be like if we didn't have any murder laws on this planet, then people were getting killed and we'd wanna you know, deal with the murder problem going out and making moral appeals to people saying, would you please not kill anyone? You'll be happier and more successful if you don't. That's one strategy. The other strategy would be to make it illegal. Say, if you kill someone, we'll kill you or put you in jail for life. With business, people in the future are gonna wonder why we're not using the same strategy. There's a lot of good reasons why we don't hold companies responsible, but in effect, we're going out to them and trying to make business cases and saying, you'll make more money if you act more responsibly. When the reality is, is that if we don't hold them responsible, regardless of their morals or ethics, they simply will not be able to act in a fully responsible manner and survive. So under our current systems, without anyone intending to do so, if companies um, don't harm society, uh, well, if they don't harm, if they, if they harm society, they can no longer exist. If they try to end all their negative impacts, their costs will go up and they go out of business. Under sustainable systems, if they harm society, they'll cease to exist. So this brings up a key principle that um, Elon, uh, Kate, Kate Tan pointed out to me once before. He, he said it probably isn't a good idea to equate current business leaders to slave owners. And that's true. There's no intention to uh, criticize or judge anyone here. A key, a key principle of system change is non-judgment and recognizing that virtually every business leader has no intention to harm society. Their goal is to benefit society. The enemy is not these well-intentioned leaders. It's our flawed systems that make good people do harmful things. So just briefly in terms of a couple of catalytic solutions, when you're looking from the whole system perspective down at important opportunities, one of the most important ones is to switch from, especially now during COVID, to switch from private sector to public sector money creation. In the US for 230 years, we've been allowing the private sector to create about 90% of the money supply through fractional reserve lending. That nearly doubles taxes, greatly increases the national, national debt. If we the people reclaim, reclaimed our right to create the money supply, we could greatly reduce taxes, um, greatly reduce or eliminate the national debt, have a much more stable and easier to manage money supply. And most importantly, we could have all the money that we need to fund stimulus efforts, rebuild our infrastructure and implement a strong social safety net. Fractional reserve lending is just one form of corporate welfare. In total, we're transferring at least several trillion dollars a year to the top of society. This is the main cause of rising inequality over the past 40 years. If we take back our right to, right to create the money supply, uh, we can greatly benefit society. For example, 43% of people in the US can't afford to meet basic needs. That's an honest definition of poverty. It means that nearly half of the US is living in poverty. If we created and controlled our own money supply, we could greatly alleviate that. The other uh, catalytic change um, related to a question you asked, uh, Dragan, about the difference between SDG investments and system change investments involves an approach I already presented in an earlier session, but just in summary, um, SDG investments could be thought of investments that are intended to directly address uh, SDG problems. System change investments are ones that are intended to address root causes. We need both root cause investing and SDG investing to achieve the goals, because if we don't address the root causes, flawed systems that create the need for the goals in the first place, We'll never, we'll never achieve them. Okay, so just in, in conclusion, 
Um, the global leadership in the 21st century program is looking for catalytic, uh, catalytic solutions. Going all the way to the whole system, thinking about human how humanity could abide by the laws of nature can seem extremely difficult, extremely distant, and even impossible. It could seem like the opposite of a catalytic approach, but actually it probably is the most effective way to get there. For more than 40 years, we've had, you know, let's get busy on Monday morning and what can we do practically right now? These economic reform approaches have provided many benefits, but they haven't driven the scale of systemic change needed. When we step back and look at the big picture, it shows us societal interconnections, root causes, systemic barriers, um, optimal solutions, and key leverage points. It helps us to identify the most effective short, mid, and long-term strategies. So paradoxically, looking at the whole system first is probably the best way to develop uh, catalytic approaches. And one final point, as we think about a leadership in the 21st century, I'd say one of the most important things we need to do is to help leaders begin to think and act from a whole system perspective more, regardless of whatever issue they're addressing, that's gonna help them to be more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Frank. You have given inspiring framework for discussion. So now we are able to switch to the next segment of the panel, specific questions to the panelists. In doing that, we can use causal and chronological order of panelists matching line of reasoning with panelists' expertise and subjects. Before I pose the first question, I'd like to remind you that other panelists have opportunity to make short reflection up to three minutes immediately after the answer of the panelists. All panelists are pleased to make reflections. We start with Olga Algera. Olga, when, in, uh, when the long-term growth in advanced economies is almost flat, right now negative, geopolitics is situating itself on the market easily. Currency wars, trade wars, technology wars, maybe biological wars are disturbing fundamentally the global trade and investment. Also prevailing wisdom about globalization in the last pandemic is changing dramatically. Definitely we need new balance between classical globalization and self-interest in post-pandemic world. Having said that, we see that right now dynamic window of opportunities is relatively small. My question to you, Olga, is going to be, how can we reach more effectively balance reconciling the role of individual dynamism with the essential objective of maximizing the security, economic and medical both, welfare and well-being for all. And related with the previous, from your perspective, what is the role of international organization in that process? Thank you, Dragan. Very, <laughs> thank you, really. And uh, at the beginning, thank you for inviting me to speak in this distinguished panel. Uh, I like very much the Gary's framing, uh, the SDGs indeed, it is a blueprint for short prosperity in a sustainable world and I like very much uh, Frank's uh, uh, stressing out the importance, importance of the private sector and namely I was very pleased that he mentioned circular economy because uh, this is my favorite. Okay, I am an uh, uh, introduction of myself. I lead the UNEC, what is one of the five United Nations Regional Economic Commissions. So we are for Europe. Uh, we are existing 73 years and uh, in Europe we have our 56 member states. And uh, our bread and butter is indeed Agenda 2030 that we try to implement in such important uh, areas like transport, environment, energy, trade, forest and land management, and finally, and importantly, statistics. So on the topic of today, uh, current development patterns are presenting really an unsustainable trajectory. Despite advances in many areas, environmental threats persist and short prosperity remains an elusive goal. The time for action is narrowing. Worldwide, the COVID-19 crisis is exposing existing fragilities 
and living vows that will require time and sustained policy efforts to heal. The sharp decline in economic activity has provided a limited and temporary relief on environmental pressures. However, poverty and inequality are on the rise, undermining past achievements and setting back progress in advancing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Our failure to undertake appropriate collective action uh, is the root of many of the problems we face. And you mentioned that, uh, Dragan, uh, how to do it more effectively, how to maximizing uh, well-being and uh, security and uh, globalization versus self-interest. So my, my response on that would be solidarity, collective action, work together. It's clearly insufficient to rely solely on uncoordinated national interventions and on market mechanisms to address the challenges we face, either economic, social, or environmental. Uh, the ongoing crisis has raised the profile of the role of the state regarding both direct resource allocation and distribution and as a catalyst for the engagement of other actors. So this is a time to be imaginative and rethink how to design effective policies. And I'm not so pessimistic that, uh, because you mentioned that opportunities are small, I believe uh, you have always some opportunities. Uh, the pandemic and its consequences are also underlying, uh, underlining the importance of multilateral action, including uh, for us at the regional, but also at sub-regional levels. As the current patterns of globalization are being eroded, the regional level will become more necessary in dealing with, with cross-border problems. It is at this level that reconnecting economies, reversing this disruption of trade and transport links, and addressing transboundary risks offers more tangible benefits. Regional frameworks of collaboration should be reinforced as critical building blocks of multilateralism. In short, the future ahead is likely to be characterized, in my opinion, by a larger degree of state influence on the economy and a higher emphas uh, emphasis on regional and sub-regional cooperation to manage ongoing disruptions and navigate the new economic landscape. But let me go back to the question of environmental pressures and how these can be abated in a way that supports growth and shared prosperity. This question is at the core of sustainable development efforts and central to the work of the Economic Commission for Europe. We consume, we collectively consume more resources that we can afford. Uh, just to remind to all of us, the Earth overshoot day, the, we know that this is the day when the consumption of natural resources so far in the year exceeds what can be regenerated in that year, has become earlier and, uh, and earlier, and it's now estimated this year to be 22nd of August. And coming to circular economy, the circular material use rate has improved in recent years, but it remains still at just 11% in the EU, according to the latest available data. In Europe and Central Asia, only around one third of waste materials are recovered through either recycling or composting. And in a world where resources are limited, high resource consumption levels have clear implications for inequalities. We need new growth models that contribute to economic dynamism while respecting environmental constraints. And circular economy provides a conceptual and policy framework that seeks to minimize the use of resources and the creation of waste by energy recycling and reuse. Such an approach goes beyond correcting the damaging environmental implications of economic activities. It entails a deep rethinking of the way we produce and consume. This systemic shift is also a source of economic opportunities to improve productivity and sharpen competitiveness and resilience. The importance of strengthening resilience has become more acute in the context of disruption uh, created by the COVID-19 crisis. The 
I will not uh, work more on circular economy, but to conclude, we need to prioritize environmentally respectful solutions in the policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has involved large fiscal and monetary stimulus in many countries. In addition, infrastructure deficits exist in many economies, including advanced ones. And now this is the time for public leadership, for investment push that contributes to re allocate resources in support of sustainable development. And for that, we also need to create the right incentives for private sector engagement through the greening of financial systems. We shouldn't repeat and we cannot repeat past mistakes. We need to build back better. Thank you for your attention. I look forward for discussion to respond to some of the questions. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, for excellent answer, both from uh, expertise and diplomatic uh, perspective and thank you for advertising uh, circular economy model of growth and the heterodox economic policy platform. Uh, next question is going to Professor Konduri. Uh, I'm really apologize if my pronunciation is not uh, adequate but I did my best. It's perfect. Uh, uh, is it right? Yes, Perfect. absolutely. Okay, so I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm continuing Professor Kaunduri. In the last period, uh, we have been witnessing radical changes in performance measurement systems, both in macro and micro level, under the impact of paradigm change. Actually, on macro level, we have SDGs. On micro level, we have ECGs, metrics, environmental, social, and governance performance measures with the accent on E, along with standard financial measures. My question will tackle more technical, but very important question for our discussion. Aspect of economic modeling in these circumstances. In economic modeling, you are familiar with how can we change metrics of success or uh, ultimate goals to reflect more accurately the real contribution of economic activities to the universal social objectives, particularly when forces of change in the next normal, transforming economy as medium, uh, medium of economic modeling from linear system to non-linear system. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you for having me in this incredible um, panel. It's really an honor and a joy. Um, economics, I've been working the last 25 years on economic modeling, trying to integrate the three uh, main pillars of uh, our prosperity. Uh, people, economy, and the planet. We all uh, think in these uh, three pillars. When I say we, people in this panel and people that agree with us. Uh, I've uh, heard um, Gary talk about the SDGs, uh, Frank uh, talking about oh, the need for systems change, Olga talking about uh, the uh, failure of collecting action and solidarity as main roots of our problems. And this is exactly what the economic systems need to integrate, economic modeling needs to integrate in order to be able to produce sensible results that can be uh, used as a basis for policy recommendations. Um, wh when I start with economic modeling, I always start uh, with uh, the stakeholders mapping. One important angle, one important ingredient in any correct economic modeling is to understand who are the stakeholders 
who are affected, uh, who are involved, who is making decisions, who are the institutions. So you need a very clear mapping of the relevant stakeholders. These are your economic agents. And uh, you need to understand what they know, because what they know forms their values and also forms their vision for the future. And in a systems innovation approach, as um, Frank referred to it uh, before, you first need to gather the stakeholders, understand them, and try to co-create with them a vision for the future that they have ownership. That is, it is important to co-design the future and co-design with all relevant stakeholders the uh, vision for the future. Then, because we are not in a lab and we cannot have a control experiment, we have to create a model that translates what we see with among our stakeholders um, and uh, operationalize this model in order to give us um, a, um, results that can help us design a better uh, pathway for the future. In this particular modeling process, the stakeholders interact with nature within the greater society and within the economy, which is of course part of the society. So you need to create clever models that take into account interdisciplinary um, systems. We've been working in most universities, we've been working in silos, silos between disciplines. But the real world and the models we need, economic models, need to interact with nature and with the social models. And uh, all this uh, needs to be understood in a scientific way and create models that um, can uh, really uh, communicate the interaction between the different agents and nature, uh, taking into account all the interdisciplinary issues and also taking into account the fact that we work under uncertainty and we work under something even more difficult, ambiguity, because uncertainty means that I face risk, but I know the probabilities. We don't face uh, known probabilities. We face unknown probabilities, especially for the very big challenges that we are facing, like the climate change or like the possibility of recovery of a huge crisis and so on. Once you have these models, and you implement them and they need to be really clever models because they need to capture in something that is tractable uh, all these different aspects you can identify where value the values that derive from these models so the values that we economists uh, uh, understand are the values that derive from the preferences of people. In uh, basic microeconomics theory, we say that um, value reflects how much people are, are willing to pay for something. So value is something that derives from people's understanding of how a good or service uh, uh, contributes to their welfare. Once we derive the value that, e uh, that um, uh, it is implied by our model and how we derive it by applying data to our model, we derive the value for the different goods and services, and then we can allocate um, uh, resources in a way that reflects the values of the society. 
And here we have a very crucial issue. These values are dynamic because they are affected by information, education, knowledge, uh, uh, public knowledge, but also scientific knowledge, political situations, financial situations, economic situations, and so on. So what seems to be uh, important is whether we want to discuss ethical underpinnings or values for people. So that is why the SDGs and the UN Charter for, uh, Charter for Human Rights are very important because they are our blueprint for identifying some ethical underpinnings for the value that people derive from using goods and services. And when I'm talking about goods and services, I'm also talking about ecosystem, an ecosystem-based approach to goods and services, which allows you to respect the contribution of ecosystems as well as economy, as well as society to the welfare of people. So that is why it is crucially important uh, that we have uh, the um, Charter of the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well as the SDGs and I perceive that our European Green Deal is based on those, and it is truly based on those because both the SDGs and the European Green Deal are about uh, the uh, about prosperity, about ending extreme poverty, about people leaving no one behind, and about the planet mitigating climate change and biodiversity. Uh, laws. So uh, SDGs indicate a pathway to prosperity and peace. I, before the COVID crisis, we had the launch of the European Green Deal as an attempt to show that uh, decoupling environmental sustainability and growth is possible. As you all know, it will not be enough for Europe to become climate neutral, but it will be important for Europe to lead the way to show that it can be done and convince the rest of the world to endorse this paradigm. And sorry, Professor. I'm finishing. I, yeah, I, 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 let me ask say. you to stop here because uh, we have a time limits. Okay, just, just let me let's, say... Let's uh, summarize uh, as short yeah, one as minute. And just before, and once we've launched the European Green Deal, we had the COVID. And now we need to think how we can start better. Not as before, not quick fixes, but start better on a sustainable pathway. Sorry for taking... Thank you. Long. Thank you for your... Excellent explanation. Uh, let's now switch to Hunter Lovins. Uh, Hunter, very welcome to the show. It is a great pleasure. As a prominent member of the Club of Rome, you are particularly focusing on human rights and more broader goals in a new economy order. Uh, Hunter, my general question to you is going to be, how can we functioning on individual companies be more closely aligned with the human rights and broader goals of society you've frequently pointed out. And related with the previous question, I will pose two specific questions. What is the role of younger generation, Generation Z, in behaving companies in socially responsible way, particularly in COVID-19 crisis? And last, what is the impact of new phenomena like distance learning and work from home in that processes? Thanks, Dragon. 
My name is Hunter Lovins. I am president of Natural Capitalism Solutions. We work with companies, communities, countries on ways to implement more regenerative practices profitably. I'm also professor of sustainable management at the Bard MBA. So I'll take your last question first. Uh, working at distance, distance learning. In, in case uh, folk haven't realized, COVID is gonna change everything. We don't yet know how. This here wreck ain't over with yet. It is going to get worse. And yes, it is amplified by climate change. It is likely driven by our destruction of biodiversity and intact ecosystems, allowing these zoonotic diseases to reach humans. The more we destroy intact ecosystems, the more zoonotic diseases we're going to have. So this is only the first of many. And in, in systems thinking, everything's related to everything. So uh, we now see the collapse of the global economy because of a little bug we can't even see, which probably came from a bat that we didn't even know existed. We're getting a uh, rather brutal lesson in how systems work. And because it's a global economy, the whole thing's falling apart at once as people travel here and there, and we're all learning to work from home. So it's going to change how we work, it's going to change how we learn, it's going to change education. I have been teaching entirely online since March and will probably continue that way through the fall. We'll all probably continue largely working at home until we get a a vaccine that actually works and the best science says that's at least uh, six months out to more likely a year out. So get used to this. Uh, the young people. Young people are, well, it is their future that we old people are talking about and they are starting to grasp it in both hands and decide that they want to have a say in it. So groups like Extinction Rebellion, Young Greta Thunberg turned 8 million people into the streets last September, and there is nothing a politician fears worse than people in the streets. Now we have Black Lives Matter turning people into the streets, and so, surprise, we have essentially every company on earth suddenly caring about human rights. Where were they before? Well, there weren't people in the streets, so they didn't give a damn. They still don't give a damn, but they do believe now they need to say something about it. And so we have all of these platitudes coming out of all of these companies. I think what we're going to see now is the activists saying, that's not enough. What are you going to do about it? So among other things, I work with a little group called Change Finance. We were created to do just that, Change Finance. We built the first truly fossil fuel free exchange traded fund. So for the price of a pizza, you can be an impact investor and you can do this from anywhere in the world on a platform like Robinhood. And last week we issued a statement to every one of our portfolio companies. What are you doing about transparency in gender and racial dis discrimination around pay? And we are demanding that they equalize pay for both gender and race. And we'll see what comes of that. We also launched an online petition that uh, now wealth managers representing what, millions of dollars of uh, assets under management have signed on to. And this is something that uh, any of you can sign on to. Uh, when I get done, I'll put in the chat box how you can reach this petition. The thing that I think that we really are lacking, we being those of us who attend meetings like this and pretend to give a damn, is a theory of change. You know, models are interesting. All models are wrong, as Dennis Meadows pointed out. Some models are useful, but models are not gonna change the world. What will drive change? We've seen one thing that drives change, a little virus. And Gary and I were talking about this uh, before we came live. Now everybody is a theory of, uh, is a fan of what's called modern money theory. This is Randall Ray, uh, Stephanie Kelton's approach. The governments can just print money. Frank talked a bit about this earlier. 
And when governments are in charge of their own sovereign currency, they can solve problems like we're facing now simply by printing money and spending it. And so long as you have a down economy and you spend the money on real infrastructure, whether that be education or renewable energy or regenerative agriculture, if you spend it into the real economy, you will not get inflation. And the ultimate upper limit of this government intervention would be inflation, and yet we are not seeing inflation. And we, if anything, we're seeing deflation. Uh, oil prices went severely negative. We are in the midst of the most profound transformation human has ever experienced. And yes, we need principles to guide us, but we have a few of those. The UN SDGs work pretty well. I had a small hand in helping the Open Working Group uh, finalize those. We have John Fullerton's regenerative capitalism principles. If any of you haven't read this, I highly recommend it. I'll put um, the URL for how you get John's paper in the chat box. He laid out eight principles of what a, a truly regenerative economic system would be. Kate Rayworth's donut economics. Amsterdam is now using donut economics as the basis of their COVID recovery. Here in Colorado, I was asked by the governor's office to help convene the group that's going to craft the recovery plan, and we are basing it on Fullerton's regenerative principles, on Kate Rayworth's donut economics. What we need now is a little less talk and a lot more action. Gary, you mentioned the neoliberals uh, caring only about efficiency. Actually, I think that's not true. What they were trying to enshrine was the principle of human dignity, of the primacy of individual action in the market. What they got wrong, and it's gone a long ways wrong since they were talking about it, is they believed markets are perfect. I'm a free marketeer. I believe in market mechanisms, and we ain't got a free market. We have um, ugh, so many market imperfections, interferences in the market. The $5.2 trillion that the world spends every year to make fossil fuel look cheaper than it really is, is an interference in the market. The million dollars a minute that the world spends to make industrial agriculture look cheaper, that is a, a aberration of a truly free market. A testable hypothesis, would we solve these problems if we really had a free market? Maybe. And um, yeah, I believe in the tooth fairy too. We don't have a free market, we're never going to have a free market. So then the question is, what is the right intervention by governments? And as I said before, we're, we're seeing it. Governments are, are spending trillions of dollars to try to deal with COVID, it is critically important we spend that money well. At the Club of Rome, Sandrine Dixon, the co-president and I and some others, Kate Rayworth, um, Sean Huber, wrote a paper of a green reboot from COVID. Uh, we then fleshed that out even more. It's in the Solutions Journal and I'll put the URL for that article into the chat box. We know what we need to do to solve climate change, renewable energy and regenerative agriculture. And over 30 years time with regenerative grazing, we can walk climate change backward at a profit and get back to 280 parts per million concentration of CO2. We know how to solve inequality. Frank talked about that. Public generation of the currency, public banking, and we can solve inequality. We know how to solve the population problem. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Potts, University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health, you do five things. Feed people, reform land tenure, educate people, particularly women, provide information about and access to contraception. Every country where that's been done, population goes to ZPG and stays there. So we have the solutions. A group of us wrote a little book called A Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life, where we lay out how do we transform this economy. But one of the things we said, when the neolibs 
laid out their ideology. They said, humans are greedy bastards, but that's okay because the market's perfect. And in a perfect market, you don't need government. End of story. What's our story? How do we counter that? We go on at length about all of these principles and models and facts and figures. What's our story? The other thing the neo-libs did was they organized. They created the Montpelerin Society. They got their members as advisors to every head of state on the planet, three of them as heads of state, many of them as central bankers. In 1971, Lewis Powell wrote the Powell Memorandum for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and laid out the strategy of how do we make this ideology, the, the dominant global economic ideology, Nine years later, Thatcher was elected in the UK, Reagan in this country, and they won. If you've had an economics class, this stuff's in your head, and it's based on bad science. Humans are not greedy bastards. You go back to evolutionary biology, the archeology, span the pre-human tribes that survived cared. Humans have a caring gene, and markets aren't perfect. So government is needed. So the, the, the fundamental underpinnings of neoliberalism are just flat wrong. And this is what we need to counter. Now on the strength of the Powell Memorandum, five entities, foundations and the Koch brothers, each put something like $5 million for each of five years into creating and endowing Heritage Foundation, Hudson, Hoover, Heartland, American Enterprise, Cato, ALEC, these institutions are what have rolled out the system that we are now fighting. And until we come up with an equally coherent strategy, first the narrative, what are we about? What, what are our core principles? And then how are we gonna get them implemented? As Joe Confino, who was then uh, executive editor at, uh, at uh, The Guardian at the time said, the status quo is an enormous beast teeth barred, claws sharpened, and we're all just little mice running around bumping into it. So a little less talk and a lot more action. Okay, thank you, Hunter. It was encouraging. By the way, I know that pendulum never stops in the middle. So market must be combined with some government actions. And this is the main idea of heterodox approach. Uh, out of market fundamentalism. Uh, by pos uh, po posing the question to Professor Robert Hoffman, we switch from soft to hard issue. Uh, now we, we are in the fourth industrial revolution with new type of technological change, which is leading force in so-called next normal, uh, increasing the general level of uncertainty. Two main characteristics of this technological change are universal connectivity and disruptive character of so-called combinatorial innovations, both increasing the pressure toward deflation and market monopolization in terms of winner takes all effects. To pose the question to Professor Hoffman, I will focus on the impact of the new generation of technological breakthroughs on new economy rules. Uh, besides the threats, there are endless opportunities. Combinatorial innovations like amalgam of data science and machine learning should be successfully implemented in medical science discoveries. We desperately need it in the era of micro mutations. Pre-market rule is not an effective way to support technology change due to it, its exposed character. Switch to visible hand on the state or to ex ante intentional structural or industrial industri uh, policies, from my point of view, makes sense. My question exactly is, what intentional policies can be taken to mitigate the problems from the past and under utilization of human capacity due to inefficient economic system? After losing five years doing nothing in terms of climate change and system reforms, as well as with the impact of the last micro mutation, is this feasible? 
And more, more importantly, from your perspective, Professor, whether Joe Forrester's system dynamics is adequate conceptual platform for framing sustainable and inclusive economy, both toward the people and nature. Thank you very much for the for the question. <laughs> uh, uh, it's uh, a challenge. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I appreciate being asked to participate on this panel. I'm very, very uh, uh, honored and and humbled to be in such an, uh, a member of such an eminent panel. Uh, first, I'll say a couple of words about myself. Um, uh, I am uh, the principal and founder uh, of a company called What If Technologies, uh, which engages uh, in systems modeling. Uh, we've developed a platform upon which you can build exploratory simulation models. And I suspect over the years we've built hundreds of such models. Uh, in recent years, mostly uh, in the domain of energy systems and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the area of sustainability. So in this kind of nexus of issues. Um, I am a fellow of the World Academy. Uh, I'm proud to be so. Uh, I'm a member of the Club of Rome uh, for the past 10 years. And I can identify myself uh, with the uh, the international, uh, uh, the IFSS, uh, and the American Society for Cybernetics. So I've been fascinated in uh, 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 with uh, general system theory, and particularly as it's applied in uh, in decision uh, situations. Uh, last but not least, I uh, have degrees in economics. <laughs> Uh, which was a peculiar place to start uh, uh, to end up where I have. Uh, I'd like to tackle the question um, uh, by going back to some basics about economics. I've been interested in economics for, well, throughout my whole career. Uh, what I would like to propose uh, is that there is a need for uh, a new paradigm for economics. I think we need to reframe economic theory. Uh, uh, and unless we do so, if we carry on in the current framing, uh, we will not uh, achieve uh, the success for humanity that uh, that we are all striving for. Uh, so what I would like to do is characterize uh, mainstream economic theory, essentially the stuff that we learn in Economics 101, because it provides the foundation upon which the neoliberal dogma that we have learned to dislike uh, is based. Um, uh, and, and the policy responses uh, uh, that we have seen are based on this, this dogma, this body of theory. Uh, I think at its core, uh, mainstream economic theory is a theory of value. Uh, the theory serves to identify the concepts or variables of interest in the nature of the relationships among them that need to be quantified. The core concept in this theory of value uh, is, is production. And production in this, in this uh, uh, theory of value framing uh, is the value added by labor and capital uh, in each time period. Um, that leads us to uh, the notion that we can sum the value added by labor and capital 
uh, within a ge geographic boundary, call it a, a nation. Uh, and we end up with a single number uh, which indicates the economy, the size of the economy, um, which, as you say, it sounds a bit extraordinary. Um, we have then developed uh, a system uh, of accounting for this value added. We can attribute value added to the industries in which it originates. Uh, and we can attribute it to the, the final commodities that are uh, delivered uh, to various categories of consumers. Uh, this we call the system of national accounts. And it is the database upon which most economics uh, 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 is based and quantified. And I think it's fair to say that hundreds of millions of dollars are spent uh, compiling systems of national accounts. This body of theory is essentially uh, a system of deductive reasoning uh, that is built upon two axioms, one concerning consumer behavior and one concerning uh, producer behavior. Uh, essentially, uh, consumers are utility maximizers uh, uh, under the condition that ut utility curves are convex and additive and separable, separable so that they're additive. Uh, and producers are profit maximizers, but under the condition that marginal cost curves are U-shaped that gives rise to uh, upward sloping supply curves. Um, if, if these uh, uh, axioms are violated, the whole body of theory falls down like a house of cards. Uh, Uh, this this uh, theory uh, produces uh, uh, GDP uh, as the system indicator. Uh, so GDP is not just a measure of the size of the economy. Year-to-year uh, -year changes in GDP are what we take to be the performance indicator. And we are now well aware of the shortcomings of using GDP as the system indicator. Uh, but it's the only indicator that this body of theory supports. So why has this framing uh, produced a body of theory uh, that is bringing or has brought uh, humanity uh, to the brink of annihilation or extinction? Uh, well, first of all, uh, it is a theory that describes an, an imaginary world uh, that does not resem resemble the one uh, in which we live. Uh, the world in which we live is populate, populated uh, 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 by a species Homo sapiens, not the species uh, Homo economicus, which is what is postulated in this imaginary world. Um, one of our colleagues, Ezekiel Dror, uh, in a recently published book, uh, thinks that Homo sapiens, namely the wise species, is a misnomer. Uh, he would like to think of, of our species as being the creative species. But a species without the wisdom to direct that creativity uh, so that it furthers uh, 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 humanity that furthers humankind. Uh, this imaginary world uh, is one that has limitless access uh, to material and energy resources. Note production is just value added. 
So it's value added to freely available energy and resources. Um, the, this, this was questioned uh, by the Club of Rome uh, in, in the famous uh, Limits to Growth uh, uh, project of the early 1970s. Uh, and it recognized that our world, unlike this imaginary world, uh, uh, is limited, uh, is material limited. There's a, a finite amount of material uh, that's available to us. Um, it should also be noted that this, that our world uh, is one that receives low entropy energy from the sun. Uh, this was not recognized uh, by the limits to growth uh, and uh, has not been recognized when we speak about uh, circular economies uh, uh, very much. Uh, uh, this theory uh, is one that focuses almost exclusively on flows uh, uh, to the uh, exclusion of stocks. And when you do that, of course, you limit the capacity to do dynamic analysis and you're limited to doing essentially comparative statics. Uh, and in, in the case of this theory, it's comparative statics uh, between equilibrium states of the system. Uh, we should note, of course, that we cannot really observe the forces at play in a system that is in equilibrium. Uh, and uh, economics has, has been uh, preoccupied with the notion of equilibrium, uh, but should understand that the real world in which we live, the processes of the Earth system are far from thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, and in fact, if it weren't, uh, there would not be life on this planet. Um, it's a theory that legitimizes aggregation uh, and, and relationships among a small number of macro level variables. Uh, it's also, a, well, I've, I've been to the equilibrium part of it. So uh, what I'm going to suggest is, is we need to reframe economics as a body of theory or the understanding, the understanding of how the system works that links the configuration of earth system processes that we as, as humans uh, uh, affect. Uh, uh, that's what the notion of the Anthropocene is all about, is the impact on that biophysical world that, that, that humans have uh, that has become, in a way, one of the, the dominant evolutionary forces. Uh, and so that it, it links uh, the Earth system processes as they might be reconfigured uh, to the aspirations uh, for, call it human development, um, such as the sustainable development goals. So we have well-defined and uh, established a consensus uh, uh, of the aspirations for the change. But what we don't really know uh, is how to reconfigure. We don't have a theory that says how we might reconfigure those earth system processes, many of which we have designed and put in place uh, in such a way that we meet those aspirations. Uh, Maybe so Sebastian is a, is a good place to stop uh, because we have uh, two panelists more and we have a time for uh, Q&A and reflections. Maybe you can drill in, in, in the other aspects you intend to uh, show us. Uh, yes, where, where, I was, uh, where I will go and I will leave it aside. Uh, okay. it is to identify oh, yeah. some of the characteristics that this new body of economic theory must have. Uh, 
if, if it's to deal effectively in this world in which we inhabit. But I'll leave that aside for the moment and uh, hope to have an opportunity to make some comments on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was excellent point you made until now. Uh, sorry for interrupting you uh, before you made conclusion, but uh, you have opportunity in the in the following part of the of the session. Uh, now we can switch to Professor Vujovic. Professor Vujovic is a professor of economics, World Bank expert, and also very successful, it was very successful Minister of Finance uh, in Serbia during successful implementation of fiscal consolidation program in time of the boom stage in the global economy, 2014-2018. Uh, Professor Vujovic is a winner of prestigious prize of IMF World Bank as a Treasury Minister of the Year. International financial organizations strongly supported uh, the program I mentioned, although they qualified them as unconventional. Duki, is fiscal balance good enough and stable core for systemic and structural reforms in time of crisis? This is my general question. And I have two specific questions. Uh, when I pose previous question, I think that massive infusion of liquidity is not on table in peripheral economies like Serbia. This is the privilege only for advanced economies with uh, uh, well-developed capital market and reserve currencies. Moreover, in time of monetary relaxation, we, sh we should follow uh, Powell's advice after liquidity infusion, do not put fiscal cuts too quickly. And more importantly, what is going on with the hard macroeconomic policy regime? You support it very much. When economy remains in pause due to asymmetric shocks and black swan events. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, thanks a lot. I, uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be part of this panel and I'm really glad to acknowledge uh, uh, the really uh, thought-provoking and very interesting contribution we have seen here. Uh, you have taken me from my, from my uh, mid-student uh, years, uh, the, the Club of Rome limits to grow towards the literature of my professor uh, of economics at the Department of Economics in Belgrade. So limits to growth and the mankind at the turning point were the key sources of our thinking. And this was part where the development economics was the leading discipline. Uh, second, you have also reminded me of all the other things that I have done before coming to the World Bank, which is to look at the, at the uh, complex uh, aspects of development. I, I spent my postdoc uh, in, in UC Berkeley at Giannini Hall, uh, which is called the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. So, so this is where I tend to overlap with a lot of things that you have mentioned. And then the critique of economic theory is something that's close to heart. Uh, my uh, spending, uh, I've spent uh, like almost 10,000 days at the World Bank. They give you this when you retire. You know the exact number of days you have slaved for, uh, for IFIs. Uh, and the second, I've, I've spent years at the university and finally volunteered as the Minister of Finance. And you realize that in real life, you have ideals and then you have schools of political and economic thought and then you have reality that you have to handle. And I think this transpires to everything you do. So, so I have a, 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 a lot of ideas after listening to you, a lot of ideas. I appreciate suggestions for micro uh, initiatives, but I also would like to add that uh, uh, Robert just mentioned here, the need to attack the fundamentals of the wrongly positioned economic theory. I think economists respond to demand. So this, the world of, of the body of economic uh, theory was formed in the first and second industrial revolution with the crown of liberal economics at the gold age of 
so-called capitalism. So they were responding to issues of the day and they were beautifying the reality, but they were very selective in this. You know, somebody noted rightly, I think it was Raga Ramovich that, that uh, uh, Gary worked with and, and, and actually shared uh, uh, the same premises after his World Bank career, that people selectively adopt liberal regimes, free trade and protectionism. So Hamilton was the, was, the, was the godfather of protectionism in the U.S. that the U.S. would not have liberated itself from the, col from the colonial powers of Britain without his theory. He was the quote unquote, I say, one of the founding fathers that sacrificed his presidential ambitions to become a good economist. And ever since, U.S. followed those policies until it, it became their interest to go for, for free markets, outside of the areas that they thought were better controlled. And this is the real world that happens all the time. It is our duty that based on this intellectual platform to see what is weak here. Just one comment, side comment, we don't have much time. Side comment is, if you look at the utility function, you will see the causes of all the problems. They limit the utility functions to goods and services consumed by an individual. And anybody here in the coronavirus who has parents, family, kids knows that it's not only your goods and services, but it's those next of kin. And if you are a bit of an altruistic person, it is also the welfare of the whole society that impacts you. I live in a neighborhood that is 10 miles away from the riots in downtown Washington. We live in a, in a very quiet, uh, well-to-do, but not wealthy, but well-to-do neighborhood we can leave our doors open for three months and nobody will, nobody will try to steal, uh, except for deers that walk by here and eat my wife's roses. So we discovered that we thought somebody was stealing roses that were actually rose, rosebuds were uh, ideal for, for deer to, uh, as their dessert uh, on the way to the, to the creek down there. So the point is the quality of life, you can have pockets of good life next to neighborhoods that were, that were, uh, that were really in a disarray and people who are fighting for the right human cause cannot resist to steal and destroy their own cause. Now, back to, the, to my main, main question that, that Dragan has, has asked, uh, what was I, why did I decide to, to go to, back to Belgrade after I retired from the World Bank after these 10,000 10, days of service? It was a challenge from my, from my youth. Uh, first challenge was before I left to go to the World Bank, uh, I was being offered the position at university in government, in the university I worked for five years and then I left. In, in government, I refused the first position because it was uh, not really uh, promising at that time. Although Ante Markovic was a, was a very, very kind of a forward looking and, uh, and uh, 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 how shall I say, pragmatic leader that was trying to get former Yugoslavia outside of the, of the, of the soft socialist system into a market system. I decided to go to the World Bank. The next challenge came after the big change in 2000 when the new democratic government got elected. And I was asked by late uh, Prime Minister Gingis to come, but they could not provide uh, uh, continue, continuation of my daughter's education in the US. The visa status was a problem. They could not provide income, so I would have to sell everything. And it was too much of a sacrifice. So I said, sorry, I cannot accept it at this time. And then came the one after I retired and I could not say no that time. Although uh, I, I thought that the scope for, for uh, doing something was bigger earlier. So I took that job at a very unlikely uh, set of circumstances. Co government was running at eight point some percent deficit mid-year 2014. The world was progressing. Serbia was down 3.7% in that quarter. GDP fell 3.7%. Uh, we had 78 days of, of fiscal reserves, uh, and that was all that we had. It, this was after a uh, 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 $1 billion uh, loan from the United Arab Emirates. So I said, so what do I do? So you have to, in a real world, where you're faced with the, with the conservative environment, where you're faced with, with, the, with financial markets that were giving you 650 basis points premium, over every dollar you borrowed. Uh, 
uh, we, a country that has uh, had a, a decline in GDP, country that had the twin deficits that were not sustainable, clearly not sustainable, 8.6% fiscal deficit and 12.5% current account deficit. So you are given the, the, the commands of a Titanic just after it crashed, you know, into the, into the iceberg. So what we did is use your common sense. I could not say, I could not criticize the IMF and the World Bank, but I could find a way of establishing a program. And then later, and this is what Dragan was asking, later tweak this to, to go to reasonable balances. They were asking us to cut only expenditures, don't touch revenues. They were asking us to, to get down to Maastricht criteria in every respect in, in, in two, two and a half years. They were asking us to, to essentially go into a, a fiscal uh, squeeze. And this was politically not a viable strategy. We had to go and cut some pensions and wages. Uh, with hindsight, I believe that we should not have called this cut of pensions, but basically cut subsidies to the pension fund, which is what we did. Half of the pensions were, were remunerated from the contributions and wages and salaries, and half was being subsidized from the budget. Based on, on pension rights that were never truly economically earned, because a bunch of, uh, you know, a huge portion of it was based on, on pension rights, quote unquote, earned in the 80s and 90s when the country was in, in a huge recession and, and a real value of the contributions was close to, close to zero. So despite all of this, we actually then what we call un unconventional, we had to agree, uh, sign an agreement that, that sounded very conservative and then consistently overachieve in the coming two or three years in order to, to cut the deficit from 6.4 the first year to 3.9 to 1.3, then to surplus. And they're now eating that surplus and, and distributing because the patience of those who, who had to suffer the, the cuts is, is, is wearing out. What is the, the, the message here? Uh, the point is, I could not do a, a, a heterodox program openly. But I must say, I, I admired the, the wise and, and experienced people at the IMF who understood the name of the game. So David Lipton was the first one to recognize the, the, the real pillars of this program and recognize that we have a good intention to put the economy back on track rather than just play a game. Plus, we said we don't want IMF financing. We had a precautionary four-year arrangement to to establish commitment, long-term commitment. But we said, we don't want to depend on this. We want to be able to reestablish our credit worthiness, go out and borrow. Our financial markets, you heard some very good words of criticism. My financial markets, right? No. So they overreact. When you're in bad situation, they increase the interest rate spread. And I said, this is completely crazy. You expect the worst performing countries in the world to pay twice the interest rate of those. Uh, Germany was getting a spread of 0.5% or even negative spread. And Serbia was getting a spread of 6.5%. 6 so our loans were 7, 8, 9%. In four years, we lowered that spread to 100 basis points, to 1%. That, that is why? Because once you turn the tide, once they start believing you, then they work for you. So they were actually chasing you to get additional borrowing and we were able to refinance and, and save between 60 and $70 million on every billion we refinanced. Now that is the world, the classical world that was developed over the years. So economists are not doing what we expect them to do. Uh, we have a lot of reasons to re-examine many things here. I heard some excellent remarks here that the whole concept of democracy, whole concept of urbanization, whole concept of economics is up for review, deep review, because there's no need to wait for four years and imperfect partocracy when today we have media like this where six or seven and, and 48 followers can get online and discuss many things. Uh, there's no need. Why are they opposing vote by mail and vote by post? Because they want to control the whole process. Otherwise, it is impossible for me. I was here 
uh, during the last years of, of uh, Jim Carter administration and the, and the change of guards with, with Reagan. And I still cannot understand who are the people who voted for conservative policies. How do they get much? I understand that the big capital votes for him, but why do they grassroot people work for him? I don't understand. The answer is obviously very simple. They pick some value issues and exaggerate them to the point of break. You know, is it pro-life or, or uh, uh, choice, pro-choice? And these are completely artificial issues, you know. These issues do not reflect, and we see this now in these, in these riots, these issues do not reflect the nature of the job, the value systems in big cities and the rest of the country. And they, they underestimated the effect of the NAFTA agreement on the, on the rural semi-urban, semi suburban America, because these people were never convinced. And then I, I will just uh, call one, one big, two sentences from, from Danny Roderick, who said basically, yes, free trade, but on the margin, whatever uh, industries get, get, uh, 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 get lost in this process, the assumption is that the, that the labor and capital will, fi will find equally productive use elsewhere in the economy. If they don't, then you may lose from free trade. And this is what you're seeing. When you add regional dimension, then you see the complexity of the world in which we live. Coming back to what you're saying, uh, I, was, uh, I was given a bus on a windy road in, in, in Montenegro. There's a road between Kotor and the top of the mountain Lochen that only good drivers can do. You know, it has 25 uh, steep serpentines going up the hill. They have the same bus, the same commands, you know, the same clutch, of, uh, manual shift, but only few people can do it because as you make the turns, you know, the, the stone wall uh, uh, goes before your eyes at about uh, half a yard. Uh, so this is what doing economics is. What I'm saying is the following. We have to work in the circumstances that we are given and we have to work towards changing this world. I hear say, see, see and, and support need for action. And I believe what we need in addition to the global conceptual things that were laid down by, by our colleagues uh, we need and micro initiatives. I think we need to see whether we can synchronize and, and, and commission some work in economics, basic economics, that will essentially challenge very simple, simplistic assumptions of the economic theory that were challenged before. You know, they were challenged many times before. Look at the welfare economics, look at many things. Look at what has been done in the World Bank in the 60s when they were talking about redistribution with growth and my professor Edelman the distribution before growth. So there are ideas, many ideas before. Let's collect all these ideas and make an make a action plan that will, that will uh, lead to change. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wivich. Fi uh, finally, we can switch the impact of finance on new economy rules. If, if I may add one footnote here, I, I made a remark. I absolutely agree with you, but I did not want to repeat something that, that Giscard d'Estaing and, uh, and our esteemed colleagues from Berkeley did. It's a, there's a book called Exorbitant Privilege, which explains, I think, in very much in detail uh, what is the, the privilege that the UK used to have when sterling was, was the leading currency and what US has today with the role of the dollar. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as we know, finance swallows all previous aspects in one perspective. Uh, Catherine is an excellent person to, to discuss that. Without any doubt, there is no disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street, not only in time of crisis, but also in normal time. Capital markets are full of bubbles and did not send the right signals to investors, particularly to investors in the real economy. The situation is much better concerning the high tech. Nasdaq never been in negative territory during the pandemic. From the other side, the financial intermediaries, both in bank centric and capital markets centric economies are favorites of policymakers and lawmakers. And consequently, they are main barrier to change. I'm not confident about the necessity of unconventional arsenal of monetary measures like bank bailouts instead, uh, creditors bailout, negative or near negative interest rate, uh, QE forever, 
emerg uh, emergency state bond and uh, last period corporate bonds buying, yield curve control, etc. From my perspective, all these measures do not lead to sustainable solutions. Moreover, this is the way to increase current wealth gap. Ketan, I want to pose the nexus of related quick questions to you. Firstly, how do you predict vulnerability of the financial system in post-pandemic period? Also, from your perspective, what is the next normal in the world of finance going to look like? And the last, related with the previous two, how to make smooth transition from current financial system full of bubbles and uncontrolled liquidity infusion to new one we want. Let's share your opinion once again with us about green QE and parallel tracks in financial reforms. Thank you, thank you, Dragon. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me to this so interesting panel. Um, uh, let me just make a brief introduction. I'm Gitlin Patel. I'm an investment manager um, in a firm, Greater Pacific Capital, that I founded with some friends. Um, our job is to manage money, the sort of money that might come from your pension funds. Uh, and I'll go a little bit more into that. Before that, I was the head of the strategic group of Goldman Sachs. And uh, in a career before that, I worked in industry for a technology company, Hewlett Packard, and in between for a consulting business too. Um, so I've had the opportunity to, to, to work in industry and finance and advisory um, and to manage money. So um, for us, what happens is all of you probably have a pension and your pension as a trustee, and that trustee has to make sure that you get your pension when you're ready to retire. They give some of that money to people like myself, whose job it is to take risks to give that return. In giving that return, I have a very specific task. I have to hit a certain minimum return that is set as a hurdle. And if I don't cross that hurdle, they will not allocate me money again. Now, at core, that is the essence of the financial investing model that underlies our system. If I fail, you will not have a great pension. And there are people like me everywhere who are, are considered the specialists who will invest that money. You'd be enormously unhappy if I failed. Uh, let me assure you, you know that too. Um, so what are, my, what are my variables that I can, I can actually work with? Uh, and this comes right into your question too. I could choose where I invest that, and I could choose it to make an impact in something sustainable. But if I did, and that was not profitable, and did not give you the return, I'd be fired, and someone else would get that money. So my incentive is within the time horizon set by your trustee and pension manager to figure out what to do with that capital. No more, no less. My freedoms are a function of only whether I can give the return and still make my choices. We as a firm chose to make what we think are a series of ethical choices, not to invest in businesses that pollute, that mistreat animals, mistreat people, and so on. And it's harsher than the World Bank guidelines tend to be. But that was our choice. If we still don't give the return, we still fail. And, and in essence, that is the financial system. That's at a micro level. Now, um, somewhere in my early stages of, of academia, I studied as an economist uh, at the LSE. I remember having um, a professor, Morishima, um, who's, who pondered on why Margaret Thatcher won the election. And, and it comes to the question that was just asked just before me. Um, he said, um, the alternative made the future look gloomy. And that was it. It wasn't anything other, perhaps, according to him, that the public listened to the alternative who said it's going to be a disaster. You know, we'll have a horrible economy, all of you will be out of jobs, you know, this will be awful if we accept Margaret Thatcher. And so the public wanted hope, and they voted for somebody they thought were listening to them, they wanted to give them hope. In essence, I think our economic system is a product of the history of us having been through two wars in the last century, and arrived at freedom being the most valued thing that we think is is the defining factor for all of us. And so the economic system is designed to give us the freedom to choose. And that has enormous consequences. 
But in the battle that followed those two wars between a socialist system and a capitalist system, the socialist system was not able to generate enough surpluses, but the other system was. And in that system, with all its faults, it managed to generate enough peace, prosperity, and freedoms for people to, when they could, ignore the consequences to the environment, to deforestation, desertification, and so on. Those weren't pressing issues. The pressing issues seem to be something much more material. And I would, I would suggest that one of the failings of economics is that we are not taking economics and adding to it the psychology, the social awareness, the political system, the motivations of individuals, their education levels, their ability to judge between the truth and the post-truth society we seem to have entered into. And if we put all that together and we, we say, what is really the function of the economic system? I think this freedom factor that was the product of our, our battles and wars in the last century is what defines us today. So we have generated for ourselves a materialistic trap. And, I, and I'll describe what I, what I think that is, drawing on these different strands and how I think it works to define the economic system. So the core of it is that we have defined progress as material progress. So we have to feel we're better off. It's material possessions. That is progress. And that, that again goes back to when we were poorer, when there were maybe 1.6 billion people on the planet in 1900. By 1950, we were only at 2.4 billion. Today, we're at 7.8. And by 2050, we're at 10 billion. So the economic system had to deal with 2.4 billion people. It evolved from that point to three, or more than three times as many people and still had to cope. And so the simplicity of it was progress is material possession. Now, what does that take us? That, take us, that takes us to a demand-driven economy um, where happiness is a function of buying something. And the more I buy, the happier I feel. And so essentially, we ingrained in the system this idea that consumption, mass consumption, was a good thing. Now, to react to that mass consumption, of course, we have to deliver supply in huge, in huge quantities. And the only way to do that was to harvest the planet. And so there's a battle of scarcity, and there's a battle for natural resources, and a harvesting of the planet. And so that, that seems to make absolute sense to me from where we began. The psychology of what will make us happy drives us to harvest the planet. Um, where does finance fit into that? And, and driving to your question, where finance fits into that is finance has to, has, to, has to provide the capital, it's a tool, to the demand side and the supply side to allow us to, to perform the function of consuming and supplying that consumption. And the role of the politician whether it's a democracy, a dictatorship, or anything else, to stay in power is to make sure they promise that they will keep delivering. And any politician that doesn't is fired. The public will find them. They will rise up in dictatorships with the Arab Spring, or they will rise in the streets and democracies and say austerity isn't good enough because they want to consume. And so the politician is naturally in a trap, particularly in a democracy, but it seems that's also the case in China where they have to open up, they have to reform, liberalize, participate in this globalization in the battle for resources. And that's where we found ourselves. What is the role of science in this? The role of science is to break the limits of what we think we can achieve with the resources we have. So their job is to, I believe, keep replacing those resources or finding ways to go deeper into the planet to harvest it more. And so where does this lead as a solution? Um, Two things I think matter most. One is either science and maybe the sorts of projects that intend to put us in space, put us on other planets, so we can harvest another planet to, to help us continue to consume is one answer. Science makes the breakthroughs as one solution, and we can keep feeding the habit of mass consumerism. That's one potential solution. The other solution is that we change our values. That we go all the way back to the beginning and we say, our happiness is not linked to consumption. Our prosperity is not linked to it. And so we don't have to do it. But that would require an enormously courageous series of leaders 
or an awakening in the individual that says, I don't need to consume to be happy. I'm happy with the silence and where I am now. I'm happy with the scarcity. And that's a profound change inside an individual. It's not something we've sought to build in to the education system uh, of, of the world. So it's rare to find a country that believes that. The Tibetans were maybe such. And that story didn't end too well inside Tibet. So, you know, you have to wonder whether we can actually manage this transition. But then if we get to where we are now, so what are we learning from the COVID and taking into account the QE and the capital injection, injections that have been made by government? So within this financial system, what we find is in a crisis like the coronavirus pandemic, the rules of engagement changed dramatically. The same thing happened in 06, 07, leading up to 08. So in 08, again, central governments were able to step in and say, we commandeer natural resources. We instruct banks to merge. We instruct banks to save other banks. We print money, and we can today because we have low inflation relatively and very low interest rates and negative interest rates too. We can print at will, and we've printed approximately $15 trillion so far, seven of which is liquid, eight of which is liquid, actually, and seven is, is held in reserve. So there is no shortage of capital if we choose to print it in a crisis. The, the doubt I do have, um, and we've written recently on this to talk about the different stages of this pandemic and the world after the pandemic, is whether we've suffered enough to change. Four to six months in, four months in, most countries find they have to open up because the pressure from the public is so great. You know, World War II, there were six years of suffering, ongoing, continuous suffering. And then the world was ready for a massive change that led to the multilateral institutions. I doubt that will happen in four months. I doubt it will happen even if this lasts another year. I hope it will because we've learned how to work differently. But we've also learned that actually there is no leader as there might have been or coalition of leaders as we saw in the First and Second World War to save the world. Multilateralism has truly suffered and superpower leadership has truly stepped back during this particular crisis. So the quantitative easing is, is a natural phenomenon that you'd expect in a crisis. The government, if they can, and inflation is low, and interest rates are low, will print money. But I think that's not the core of the problem. You know, that is, if that's $15 trillion, the, the wealth of the planet, measured recently in a Credit Suisse report, puts it at $350 trillion as the wealth. 60% of that is owned by individuals, um, just slightly over 60% and 40% by governments. It's actually nearly a two-thirds, one-third split. And 60% of all that money ends up in banks. Dragon. Shall I sum up briefly? Are we at the end of the session? So let me draw that together. So I, I think what we understand is economics in a crisis is not the economic status quo. And it won't help us build that the next generation of thinking. The core of our issue is that we have founded our economic system on a simple premise based on originally the quest for freedom, but putting monetary and materialistic values at the center of it. So we have to change the values, each of us individually and collectively, to actually change that economic system. Thank you. Thank you, Ketan. It was wonderful. And thank you, all of you. I think we lost uh, Dragon to the internet. Uh, so uh, uh, I think we should, we've had a very, very interesting, rich discussion, impossible to summarize. Uh, if anyone has one minute last words, we can make a round. One minute each, if you have something important you want to add that you think we've missed. Phoebe, please. Unmute, yes. Thank you very much. I've, I didn't introduce myself. I wanted to say that uh, uh, at the moment I'm leading some initiatives that I uh, consider important to this discussion. Sorry, 
Okay, uh, that I consider important to this discussion is identifying pathways for the implementation of the European Green Deal based on the SDGs and the recovery plan. And I am uh, leading with Jeff Sachs uh, this senior working group, which I think it would be crucial for the allocation of spending on um, for the allocation of the recovery fund of the EU. Uh, I'm also leading some other initiatives like sustainable shipping and ports, uh, a global roundtable bringing uh, different stakeholders, shipbuilders, ship owners, uh, policy makers, in order to making, uh, in order to identify pathways towards uh, sustainable oceans. Uh, but in, in all that I do, uh, and I cannot list them now. One crucial thing that the current economic paradigm is um, informed about, we use it, is that the total economic value includes altruistic values, includes conservation values, includes bequest values, includes uh, indirect use values, the values of supporting ecosystems includes option values and of course it includes use values. So for me it is important to do some justice to the microeconomic underpinnings of value and the ability of this concept of value not only to include all these uh, uh, issues, concepts that this amazing panel has brought from forward, but also to value, estimate monetized values of these concepts and integrate them into investment allocation and policy making. So it is important that we are at a stage that there is cautiousness and awareness of all these values, but also important to recognize that the last uh, let's say 30 years, the, the microeconomies uh, have been focusing quite intensively on estimating these values and integrate them, integrating them into policy making. And this is why we can integrate SDGs in investment allocation as well. I stop here. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry for my mismanagement of the panel uh, in accordance with the time limits. Uh, definitely, we lost opportunity for most attractive part of the panel uh, Q&A. Uh, now we have only a couple of minutes uh, to wrap ups and uh, conclusions, and I, I, I'm like to transfer the floor to the Gary uh, to, to make conclusions. Okay. Well, Dragon, when you disappeared for a minute, I took the liberty. Yes, last last five minutes. Yes. I just in, I took the liberty of inviting anyone who would like to make a one-minute addition. We would. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. And end it that way. No, of course. So uh, Olga and then Frank and I think we're going to go around one minute, please. So let's keep it to one minute. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, in the wrap up, I would like to conclude uh, where we started. SDGs and Agenda 2030, adopted by all 193 United Nations member states. It is a blueprint for progress, you know. And to stress out multilateralism, solidarity, no one can uh, develop a well being inside of only on state because uh, it's impossible. The, as we see viruses and uh, environmental disasters, it will all jump over our borders. And on that, uh, we need to find some common language that uh, will facilitate communications and concerted actions. And uh, this is what we are doing. We are work, uh, elaborating normative work, including standards, guidelines, and I believe it is a critical to find this common language for the progress of economies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I would just say that, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed hearing all the uh, deep expertise on the panel, especially the real world experience. One thing that becomes clear to me is one aspect of, of the work is to raise public awareness. 
the basic idea that darkness can't survive in the light is so important because so much of what is happening now is perpetuated by lack of understanding by average citizens. If they understood the injustice of fractional reserve lending or things like that, it wouldn't be tolerated, just like the George Floyd murders. As uh, Caton said, pain is the great teacher. Um, if we help people to understand that under our current systems for companies, if you don't harm, uh, that the company will die if it doesn't harm society. And under a new system, the company will die if it does harm society. We force them to harm. That's, that can only exist when people don't understand what's going on. And then the great division of society can be solved, I think, by raising public awareness. We see now um, stimulus uh, being provided to the, the top of society, wealthy campaign donors, but they're about to take it away from average citizens in, in the US. Um, and also suppressing votes through suppressing mail-in votes or online voting, suppressing competitors to win. Th this kind of injustice won't last. It's going to end one way or the other. We help people see that keeping things the same isn't an option. It's either going to crash or we'll change it, and we're much better off changing it on our own. So I think raising awareness is key. Thank you. Robert. Okay. It, well, in, in just, uh, I, I had a couple of uh, points I wanted to make about uh, what a new body of theory must. Uh, really, uh, must, please. Okay. Um, very quickly, uh, we need to recognize Aspie's law of requisite variety. Uh, we need an understanding of, of complex systems. Our challenge is to accept complexity uh, and rise to the challenge. Of, of trying to communicate uh, a common enough understanding that we can make coherent actions. We need to embrace unpredictability. Uh, we need to avoid what I would call the end state fallacy, uh, that we know enough that we can set an objective 40 years out and know enough now uh, about how to get there. Uh, and so we, we need an adaptive approach. Uh, we need to uh, 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 identify pathways that are that are biophysically coherent, uh, knowing that, of course, new pathways will emerge as we learn more or as uh, uh, events that we can't predict unfold. Uh, and so we need to think of economics as a process uh, as much as, in some sense, a fixed understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Last words, anyone else? Okay. Well, I would- I mean, it's for me, maybe? Of course. Yeah. Of course, please go uh, ahead. Yes, I, I will be very short. Uh, from my perspective, our role as thinking public or intelligentsia is twofold. Implement viable solutions, and not park, delayed, or deviate from some solutions we are agreed upon that are urgent and have purpose. One of them is circular economy growth model and heterodox economic policy platform. Another one is the tax system reform. We need universal profit tax, universal carbon tax, universal medical tax, at least, and maybe universal VAT tax. Keeping in mind that essence of leadership is not extortion of power, but the timing of that extortion, I will conclude my explanation. Thank you, Dragon, for- A quick, a quick for, one, one minute. To, uh, yes, yes, sir. I think what's what's coming out of this. I would like to start with the with the recommendation of Hunter. Uh, uh, we need a theory of change, and I think people were dreaming about social change and economic change in 19th century. That was way too early. You know, they were they were perceiving injustice of the early capitalism and trying to fight that. Today, we are moving towards an age where abundance of goods is not going to be a constraint. So our whole economics is defined on production of goods. Today, they produce so many things. I, I don't have the time to learn my, my smartphone commands and they come up with the new model. I think that food has been in abundance production and supply and we still don't know 
how to avoid hunger in the world. So the issue is really no longer going to be the, the old limit limitations are gone. The new limitations which we assume to be public goods are now effective constraints to growth and future. So the question is, how do we package this? My only recommendation is we heard so many ideas. There's no time to wrap up, but I would suggest that we share some, some uh, on, on an email, some uh, key points that we made and see whether we can iterate something that will, pro that will move these ideas closer to action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to close with one point that we have not, an elef the elephant in the room that we have really not touched with, I think is linked to virtually everything we've said, fascinating discussion uh, with a lot of commonality of values uh, from different perspectives. But there's a reason why Mount Pelerin society was wrong. And there's a reason why with the belief in freedom that the, 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 free, the extreme freedom of neoliberalism is actually destroying freedom in society and undermining democracy. And the reason is that, calc and there's a reason why the mac microeconomics doesn't work, even if you get the value right for the individual and the choice of the individual, because our choices are not just made by individuals, they're made by the distribution of power in society. Our market system doesn't work because it's governed and geared and biased by who has the power in the society, just as it was under monarchy, just as it was under industrial capitalism in the 19th century, just as it was under slavery. Uh, the market system doesn't really give freedom of choice to everybody. It gives an advantage to those who have more power. And that's exactly the way our economic system is working today. And I'm mentioning that uh, because that's why the theme that we all agree to, that the values are central. The principle of the values is an equitable distribution of social power, not just money power, the right to. There's a reason why every society, we, we advocate democracy, we advocate the distribution of political power because no society has proven that it could be as effective as a society when the political power is widely distributed. There's a reason why every society advocates universal education, because the, the, the dissemination of educational knowledge power, freest access to knowledge power, is a more effective system than when some few people keep the knowledge to themselves or they keep the power, the political power to themselves, even though we may be ignorant uh, uh, in any case and make ignorant decisions. And I think the problem with our system that why the values are so important is because the values are saying that the maximum distribution of all types of power and economic security and employment and uh, economic purchasing power are one but very, very central form of power without which we don't really, without a job in a democracy, you don't really have the right, the, you don't have freedom. The job is the economic equivalent of the right to vote. Is your freedom? What can what can you exercise? So I think that uh, uh, the, the values are a positive way of talking about power, and the emphasis when we really commit ourselves to the values, we're committing ourselves to a wider, much more equitable distribution of all forms of power in society, not just the political power but all that makes for welfare and well-being. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and participating so creatively, so uh, emphatically uh, to our thinking. And you know, for the Academy, this was really just a, uh, a first effort to bring some very interesting people together to discuss and see what would come out of it. But we have another five months before we go to uh, Geneva and before we prepare a final report and there's much beyond that. So uh, we invite you, I invite you on behalf of the Academy, please let's continue this discussion. Let's see how we can, as Dushan said, let's see how we can take it out for a ride 
and go beyond. This is a first exchange of ideas and meeting of minds. And uh, for me, it's been very fascinating, but it's only the beginning. And our ultimate goal are the catalytic strategies that will really effectuate the change. We haven't had that discussion today. We touched on it a little, but I think this was necessary. It doesn't mean that we've exhausted the possibilities. There's a lot that follows from this. And I look forward and hope for the opportunity to interact with you all much further on this. And Dragon, thank you for your uh, c conducting the orchestra. It was great pleasure for me, Gary. Uh, our time is up. Thank we you. We really appreciate your, your time. And I'm announced the closing of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Keep safe. Bye bye. Pleasure meeting you. Oh, hi. See tomorrow, baby. See you tomorrow. Thank See you. Tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. And Dushan, see you again after long, too long, two years. <laughs> yeah.